Okay, good evening, everybody. Good to see everybody here on Arkenstone this evening. Good to see people with me here on at, on Twitch and on Twitter, Discord, and all over the place. Welcome, everybody. Uh, great to be with you guys this evening. Thanks to everybody who uh, joined me on Saturday for a really fun webathon which went on for ended up being uh, 13 and a half hours. Uh, it was great fun. Uh, I really enjoyed hanging out with you guys over the course of the day. And of course, uh, you guys were so good and so generous. We raised uh, a, a record amount of money in a couple different dimensions. We That was the, the most money we've ever raised during a single webathon over the course of that, uh, of that period. We ended up raising actually close to fifteen thousand dollars, and we ended up the day. Um, you know, we we ended up the the campaign at uh, almost thirty, almost sorry, almost fifty fifty four thousand dollars raised, uh, which beats our old record by more than ten thousand dollars. It was really amazing. So, thank you guys so much for your help. You those of you who attended the webathon and heard the. Uh, my state of the university address where I talked about Signum and who we are and what we do and uh, our budget and all that kind of stuff will remember that, uh, you know, I had I had mentioned we had a, a $60,000 goal uh, for fundraising for the course of the year. So we're already 90% of the way to our uh, annual goal uh, here in the middle of October. So that is really fantastic so thanks everybody for all that you have done thanks for your generosity and helping to support this and i am really excited uh to continue moving forward um the, keep in mind by the way uh that um oh and for those of you who did miss it uh Sikai, i see uh, your note there um we do have a recording of the entire webathon we're going to be posting the different segments uh uh up to youtube uh during the course of uh of this week i believe so uh keep if uh, if you just subscribe to our youtube channel then you'll get notifications uh when those go up um so anyway all right so uh, uh, one other quick announcement, but in addition to just saying thank you for all of your support during the fundraising campaign, um, the, uh, the, the other thing, we've got another a regional event coming up. So just, what, a week and a half ago, I was in Iowa for our first ever Midwest regional event, uh, which was wonderful fun. Um, and... Um, then we, but we have we have another regional event coming up. This is our first visit to the Midwest, uh, and now we are going uh, we are going down uh, deep in the heart of Texas in January. So January thirteenth is going to be our first ever Tex moot, uh, and uh, that's going to be uh, uh, that's going to be uh, great, great fun. Uh, wonderful group of people uh, down there in Texas. Uh, so I hope if you are anywhere, we're, we're going to be in Fort Worth. Uh, on January 13th, if you just go, we actually have a, a, a special web page. One of the uh, one of the our local organizers down there uh, whipped up a separate page, so you can check that out at textmoot.org. Uh, there's a link to the registration. The registration is uh, is really inexpensive, as uh, all of our regional events are. It's only thirty dollars. That includes lunch. Um, so uh, thirty dollars for the day down there in Texas. And uh, I'm gonna I'm I'm looking forward to, to to going down there and being able to to meet folks and hang out down there. So definitely. Um, uh, oh yes, uh, S. Walters. I see that. Yes, I I I'm I'm looking forward to be. I think you're gonna be able to make it to Text Mood, right? I'm looking forward to meeting you uh, and uh, a number of other people. So. Anyway, oh yeah, so the Mad Violinist and Mike asks if the uh, web and th if the Webathon segments are going to be in any of the podcast feeds. Yes, I think so. Um, definitely. Uh, I'm not quite sure. I, I'm I'm uh, still in. We're st I'm still in conversations with uh, with our, our our digital media folks about where we're going to put what. I'm pretty sure, for instance, the Tom Bombadil segment will go in the Tolkien Professor feed, and the Star Trek class will go in the Mythgard Academy feed, uh, and that kind of thing. So we'll we'll definitely put uh, most, of, especially the major segments in the podcast feeds. Uh, so. Yeah, but, but they'll all be, Tony, they'll all be on YouTube. Um, I think we'll just make probably a separate uh, Webathon uh, playlist for the uh, for the whole lot, I suspect. Um, 
but uh, cool. So okay, so Tex Moot, January thirteenth, and but 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 not just January thirteenth. I don't want to just uh, the point is not only to emphasize that you should come in a couple months, which you should, but the point is um, they're doing a call for papers right now. So if you want to come uh, and you're interested in maybe uh, 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 reading a paper. That would be really cool. So uh, the call for papers is up on the website there. Uh, the uh, theme of the conference is stories for the refreshment of the spirit. Uh, thinking of the the uh, story that uh, Lucy Pevensey reads in the Magician's Magic Book uh, in the Voyage of the Dawn Treader. Um, and uh, so looking at the role of... Uh, not only the role of healing and consolation in stories, but the role, but the role of stories in healing and consolation as well. Um, so uh, anyway, that's going to be uh, that's going to be really really uh, uh, cool. I'm looking forward to, uh, to that. I'm going to be talking about uh, some of that stuff, healing and consolation in Tolkien. Um, going to be giving a little a little talk on that down there. So anyway. Definitely, if uh, uh, if if any of you have any ideas or thoughts about that, we'd love to 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 get your input on that. Again, go to textmoot.org and you'll be able to find uh, the information there for the call for papers. Okay, um, very good. Uh, let's um, let's 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 talk about the. So here's what we're gonna do tonight. Tonight is a big night because tonight. We are going to finish chapter seven. That's right. I am setting out to finish chapter seven tonight. Uh, it's going to be pretty cool. I'm feeling pretty confident. So let's see. Let's see how we do here. Okay. So tonight's class is called The Eye of Bombadil. And, uh, uh, well, you'll you'll see. Of course, it's that one visual image that I'm particularly focused on, but I think it has uh, wider application uh, than that. But uh, but let's go through and show show Matt that I can follow through there. Okay, so remember they were uh, we were just looking at the scene where Frodo was in was in awe, right? Where he was feeling awe and fear, looking back at the you know the, the as the story as Tom's. Enchant the enchantment of Tom's story was bringing them not only into sort of the minds of the trees and the beasts, but also back into his own experience and back to, to what it was like in, under the stars, right, before the rising of the sun and moon. Um, and that, of course, is what prompts Frodo to ask his question a second time about who are you? And we talked about Bombadil's answer last time. Um, so... Um, Right after that, we get we get this this transition is really interesting to me. A shadow seemed to pass by the window, and the hobbits glance hastily through the panes. Tom Bombadil has just said, um, "I remember the the uh, the the dark under the stars when it was fearless before the Dark Lord came from outside." Okay, and then we get. A shadow seemed to pass by the window, and the hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. When they turned again, Goldberry stood in the door behind, framed in light. She held a candle, shielding its flame from the draft with her hand, and the light flowed through it, like sunlight through a white shell. The rain has ended, she said, and new waters are running downhill under the stars. Let us now laugh and be glad. And let us have food and drink, cried Tom. Long tails are thirsty, and long listenings hungry work, morning, noon, and evening. With that he jumped out of his chair, and with a bound took a candle from the chimney shelf and lit it in the flame that Goldberry held. Then he danced about the table. Suddenly he hopped through the door and disappeared. Okay, so the transition here, as I say, is, partic is I find really interesting, because it's a very ominous introduction to Goldberry, right? You know, we get this, um, a shadow seemed to pass by. So he's mentioned the Dark Lord coming from outside and a shadow passes by the window. And it's like, what, what terrible thing is coming by outside? Is there, is there darkness descending upon the house? The hobbits glancing hastily through the panes. The implication to me is that the hobbits, that's that fear is the hobbits reaction as well, right? As they're glancing through the panes nervously, seeing something moving outside. And then they turn again and she's not just 
is it Goldberry? You're like, oh, it's not something evil and scary. It's Goldberry instead. It's not just that it's not evil, it's Goldberry. It's that it's not dark, it's light, right? It's they see a shadow, and then they turn, and it's not a shadow. It's the opposite of a shadow, right? It's Goldberry framed in light. She held a candle, shielding its flame from the draft with her hand, and the light flowed through it, that is, through her hand, like sunlight through a white shell. Um, yeah, yeah. Tony, I, 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 was, I was just being really struck by that description, too. The description of Goldberry's hand. Um, yeah, now, of course, everybody's hands are, 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 or fingers, anyway, are a little bit translucent, right? But hers do seem a little bit more translucent than usual. Um, and it's interesting that the light, the candlelight shining through her, her hand um, is not... It's not red, it's white, like sunlight through a white shell, right? Um, that's pretty remarkable. Um, translucence, I agree. Um, Lady Shmebiok says, like light coming through leaves, uh, and, uh, and as Tony suggested, perhaps like a, like a flower's petal, right? Um, yeah, and... Uh, Tom, I, I, I agree. Uh, you know, Tom says, like the light that shines from Frodo, you know, the, the, the one that Sam can see sometimes, right? It, it shines through sometimes as, as Sam says, yeah, you do get a sense that, um, that it's the light. It's not just shining from the candle, right? That this is her light in some sense. I have to admit, I don't fully understand exactly what it means when it says Goldberry stood in the door behind framed in light, framed in light as if the light were shining from behind her. But it's not light outside. It's getting dark outside. Um, so, I mean, maybe she's framed in, you know, sort of dim light but i don't know um i mean that would suggest that she's a darker shadow with light behind her that phrase framed in light um but i'm not really sure uh she held a candle shielding its flame from the draft with her hand the very fact that she's coming in with a candle suggests that it's dark outside right um and the light flowed through it through her hand, I guess. The light of the candle, right? Not the light in which she was framed. Um Yeah, I'm not, I'm just I'm I'm not sure I'm visualizing this scene properly. Hang on a second, let me let me think about this a little bit more. Okay. A shadow seemed to pass by the window. When they turned again. So it's obviously light enough outside that they can see her passing as a shadow, right? Uh, if it were totally dark outside, they wouldn't. Unless she were holding a candle in her hand, in which case they would, right? Um, yeah, Matt says perhaps the lit room frames her while the outside dark is the background within which she stands. Yeah, and Erokeb says, is she backing into the door, turning as she enters, so the candlelight first frames her and then passes through her hand? Yeah, I think it's... I think it's darker outside. Hmm. Gosh, this scene is much more confusing than I had thought. Uh, See, Mad Violinist, that's a really good question. Was she ever outside? Hang on. Was the last we heard her voice coming downstairs? All right, hang on. I got to look this up again now. Let's see. Which page are we on? All right. Let's get to the bottom of this. So when do they hear Goldberry's voice last? 
Okay. He mentions it's Goldberry's washing day. Okay, they hear the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. As they looked out the window, they, there came falling gently as if it was flowing down the rain out of the sky, the clear voice of Goldberry singing up above them. So she's above them. That doesn't necessarily mean she's in the house. She's singing a rain song. And then I don't think there's any reference to her, right? I think it's the last until this moment. So yeah, I was always under the you know under the impression she must be outside, right? Because she's um, she must be outside because she was singing in the rain, right? And she's done now, so I think the rain has stopped, and she comes in with the candle, and it's but it's getting dark it's dark in the house too they've not lit lamps so i don't think the inside is lit i mean notice that tom has to has lights a lights a candle and b lights it from the candle that she's holding right um so i don't think there are any lights at all inside the room because they've been talking all day long um and the day has passed and it's gotten dark there while they've been speaking so yeah yeah, I, so Lady Shmebioc asks if Goldberry can float or fly. Well, we don't know for sure, of course. Can't rule it out. She could just have been uphill, of course. Remember the up, down, underhill thing. Um, so if the house is under the hill, there's clearly a higher elevation. that you just, she, she might just be up on the hilltop, right? Um, but uh, I don't think there's any reason to think that she's indoors. Her, again, her, her, her voice is described as coming from up above them, but not necessarily from indoors. Um, yeah. You know, I... See, it's hard. The reason I'm pausing here is that I'm trying to sort out, I'm trying to be cautious, right? Because often you get into the habit of of sort of picturing the text in certain ways and sometimes it's not based on what the text says sometimes it's even in contradiction to what the text says right and so you have to look really carefully at what the text actually does say so i'm like kind of questioning my own assumption is she outside or not the only evidence that i have to suggest that she's outside is tom saying that it's her washing day right probably that's outside right um, it's Goldberry's washing day and her autumn cleaning. Now, I want to talk about that. Um, uh, uh, oh, darn it. I've forgotten the name. What's your name? Fourth Dauntless. That's your name. Fourth Dauntless 3. I saw your post on this on the discussion board, which I really liked. I wanted to wait until next week because we're going to be talking about some of the passages that you bring up. We're going to be talking about those today. So I wanted to talk about those today and then we'll come back to um, your points next time, which I think are really interesting. So we'll come back to the washing day thing, which is what your post was about. Um, but um, anyway, yeah. So I think she's got to be out of doors. Even also the fact that Tom Bombadil comes in from outside right? And says it's Goldberry's washing day as if he had just been out with her and was coming in to the guests. Um, that's the other thing that always contributed to my belief assumption that Goldberry was outside, right? Um, besides which, here's another question. What shadow is passing by the window if it isn't Goldberry? Is there something else out there, right? Are we to understand that there is in fact a something outside right which is uh wanting to come in but can't right i mean it's at least uh conceivable right yeah oakwig that's a great point oakwig points out at least there's no film version to skew our view of this scene it's true how many times have you found yourself getting into the habit of kind of remembering a scene a vis you know like the, the visualization of a scene from the film and having that kind of supplant your like your book thought right um yeah, sometimes that is can be a serious confusion of things if you if you lose track of what's from the film and what's from the book. Um, uh, anyway, yeah. So 
Of course, it's possible that the shadow outside is something legitimately scary and that we're transitioning from, um, uh, from the, yeah, now, because you're right, Urstarg, um, it might be just the Hobbit's perception. There might not be anything there, right? A shadow seemed to pass by the window, um, and the Hobbits glanced hastily through the panes. Yeah, I think it can't be her. I think it can't be her. No, I think you guys are right. Because they glance through the panes. So they're looking at the shadow out, out the window, right? Then they turn again back to towards Tom and Goldberry stood in the door behind, right? So she so it's not like they're tracking the shadow and then it turns into Goldberry. They are they turn back from the shadow and then they see Goldberry. Um Irinda says that she thinks she's upstairs with the window open, otherwise she'd be wet from the rain. Well, Tom wasn't. Right? I don't know that that... Um, that doesn't prove to me... The fact that she's dry doesn't prove to me that she wasn't outside. Normally, that would be a pretty good indicator, right? But in this particular house, on this particular day, I'm not sure I can accept that as proof. Um... Yeah, yeah. <laughs> I read his ask, is she waving her hands the whole day? Well, we know that that's how Tom does it, but I would ask this, I read this, do we think that Tom has to do that? Like, if Tom doesn't wave his arms, then he gets wet, right? I kind of suspect that he could stay dry any way that he wanted to. I think he waves his arms because he enjoys waving his arms. Like It's like, he's, it's like a game that he's playing... It's like an inside joke with the rain or something. It's like, I, you know, I, I, I can't imagine that there's like a mechanical necessity for him to wave his arms. Um, yeah. Uh, the Mad Violinist asks, are we thinking more about this than, than Tolkien did? You know, I doubt it, actually. He was a real stickler for detail and spent a lot of time revising exactly stuff like this. Uh, in the later drafts, it's one of the things that we see him doing a lot is like, do I have... I mean, he got really concerned with, for instance, the description of the phases of the moon. This was like a big thing with him, you know, like, a, 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 do I describe it in the correct phase, rising at the correct time of day and stuff like that? So he's uh, he's fairly, uh, uh, fairly uh, uh, concerned about these kinds of these kinds of details. Um, OK. Yeah. Yeah. No, Katrina, K I'm coming around to this view. I'm coming around to this view that uh, the shadow passing across the window uh, could be something as simple as a cloud drifting across the sun or the, the, the sun or moon and is only perceived as potentially ominous because of the context of the discussion. I agree. The shadow across the window could be anything. It couldn't be nothing. In fact, it could be completely imaginary, actually. Um, yeah. Yeah. See, Cass is asking, uh, how is she framed in light if the only light is the candle she's holding in front of her? That is exactly what started me on this whole thing, <laughs> which is good, which is good. I could actually, because uh, I've come to ask a bunch of questions that I might not have asked. Um, Uh, Arthur asks, couldn't there be another room between the room where Tom and the hobbits are and the front door? So Goldberry entered the house from her washing and is now standing in a doorway between the two rooms and the room behind her also has candles to cast a shadow behind her. Maybe she, uh, could have lit another candle on her way in. So it's possible that she's framed in that way. Um, the other thing to keep in mind, we have no idea how much time has passed, right? So, um, we don't really know. Uh, I mean, she could have come in before. Then they've been oblivious. They've been enchanted, right? They're kind of waking up again and finding that they haven't eaten in many hours and that the sun's gone down, right? So um, who knows? She could have come in, you know, swept the room. <laughs> I mean, you know, uh, uh, any number of things, right? Um, so I'm not worried about, because of the strangeness of the passing of time here i don't think uh uh i don't think that uh, uh there's I, I'm, again, I'm, I'm not too worried about sort of accounting for her movements um <laughs> uh 
<laughs> Milthalio now wants to change her bet about whether we're going to get through Chapter 7 tonight. Okay, it's true, Milthalio, that I did not anticipate this particular <laughs> dilemma, but I'm still confident. Okay. Uh... Mike says he really likes the idea that the light behind her is lingering from their vision of the primordial starlight. I'm kind of wondering about that too, Mike. If we just... Forgetting the framing in light for a second, if we just consider the light of that candle, I agree with you guys that although you can... Like, the, the translucency of her hand seems unusually significant, right? That is to say, normally a candle flame isn't going to shine very strongly through your fingers, uh, and it's certainly not going to be like sunlight through a white shell, exactly, right? Um, so there seems to be, with the candle and her hand, there seems to be an unusually large amount of light, like an unnaturally large amount of light anyway, to begin with, right? So could the framing and light actually... Uh, um, basically suggest the same thing, right? That uh, um, yeah, yeah. Um, <laughs> sorry, more uh, more skepticism about finishing the chapter. Anyway, Mike, you were saying that you like the suggestion that the light that is framing her is not really a natural light. It's like that, you know, it's like a reflection of that starlight or the way in which like their sort of enchanted vision kind of resolves itself into Goldberry here, um, even as a kind of um, even as a kind of um, response to the shadow and to their their brief fear. Right. Um, yeah, um, I agree with Tungo that the draft that from which she's shielding the candle would seem to be uh, have to do with the door behind her, which I suspect to be, therefore, the outside door. Um, yeah. Yeah, I still think she's coming in from outside there. Um, And I still can't understand, I still can't give any naturalistic explanation for why she would be framed in light. Um, I think the implication is that she is in some way illuminated, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, Irindus, but I don't think the the sky filling with the light of white stars would be literally outside. Like, in the vision that they're having, that happens. Um, but outside, although the rain has stopped, it's probably still pretty cloudy. Um, yeah, so I doubt that. But... Um, So yeah, I, 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 Mad Violinist, that's exactly the conclusion that I'm coming to. The more I think this through, the more I cannot make that fit with any natural source of light. And that's why I was emphasizing about her hand. Yes, I think her hand might be perhaps unusually translucent, like a flower petal or something, but that's the point, that it's not normal, right? That we're, what, what we're getting, even from that, um, that that seems to sort of point to an unnatural, a supernatural kind of translucence in her, or even light source from her. Um, and that I think the suggestion is that the, f the f light in which she's framed may perhaps be, uh, uh, be, be similar. Um, yeah. <laughs> okay. All right. I'm going to move on. We've wrestled with this one a lot. I, I, it's interesting because the, 
details here like we're given enough detail to to speculate about it very carefully right but not quite enough detail to really solve all the problems uh so that's uh kind of challenging actually about this passage but uh but that's all right anyway um she announces that the new waters are running downhill under the stars okay fine so the rain is done and let us now laugh and be glad she says. Um, and let us have food and drink, cried Tom. And he jumps at it, so he we get lots of... Look at Tom's verbs. Jumped, and then with a bound he took, right? And he lights it in the flame that Goldberry held, and then danced around the table, and then hopped and disappeared, right? Um, as a very Tom Bombadil kind of sequence, right? Um, all of this jumping and bounding and hopping and dancing and then light this sort of domestic sort of intimate exchange right lighting his candle from goldberry's candle and disappearing right so that that seems that seems all very uh very tom bombadil there okay all right no problem slide number two we're on a roll Quickly he returned, bearing a large and laden tray. Then Tom and Goldberry set the table, and the hobbits sat half in wonder and half in laughter. So fair was the grace of Goldberry, and so merry and odd the caperings of Tom. Yet in some fashion they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other, in and out of the room, and round about the table. And with great speed food and vessels and lights were set in order. The boards blazed with candles, white and yellow. Tom bowed to his guests. "'Supper is ready,' said Goldberry, and now the hobbit saw that she was clothed all in silver, with a white girdle, and her shoes were like fish's mail. But Tom was all, was all in clean blue, blue as rain-washed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings. It was a supper even better than before. "'Do you think they dress for dinner?' "'You know, like old school, like to put on your fancy clothes for dinner, right?' Do, do you think that's what I mean? Of course, for Tom Bombadil, apparently dressing for dinner, you know, doesn't mean putting on your dinner jacket, uh, uh, you know, and your like white tie. It means putting on your green stockings. Right. So, yeah, JJ, exactly. I think that these are Tom's dress stockings. Um, yeah. Anyway. OK. Um, Tom was all in clean blue. Was his blue? He was in blue before. Was it dirty? Right. Uh, or faded or something, but now it's clean blue. Blue is rainwashed forget-me-nots, and he had green stockings. Um, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Kitriana says, uh, dressing for dinner apparently means taking your yellow Wellingtons off. Yeah, that that's kind of, that does kind of seem to be the case. Um, it was a supper even better than before. The hobbits under the spell of Tom's words may have missed one meal or many, but when the food was before them it seemed at least a week since they had eaten. They did not sing or even speak much for a while, and paid close attention to business. But after a time their hearts and spirits rose high again, and their voices rang out in mirth and laughter. Okay. Um, yeah, JJ, I agree. Blue jacket and green stockings is pretty bold, right? I, I uh... I can sort of imagine my wife's commentary on that uh, particular kind of like if, uh, you know, my sons came down for school dressed that way one day. I don't I think she might veto it. Um, OK. Ah, thank you. Brunier was just posting in the Discord chat a picture of forget me nots, um, which are pale or blue, actually, than I had. I think. I was always imagining when he says blue as rainwashed forget-me-nots, uh, I was always picturing something more like a cornflower, actually, a much, much darker blue uh, than that. That is a much paler blue, almost like an Oxford blue, uh, uh, you know, uh, that uh, the forget-me-nots have. Yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Thank you for that picture. That actually kind of corrects my image of uh, of Tom's blue. Wait, everything. He's clad all in blue. Yeah, yeah. Um. So he's clad entirely in 
pale blue. Uh, yeah, Milthalio, it it's, does seem to be more like baby blue, basically. So he's all in baby blue with green stockings. Um, own it, Tom. Own it. Okay. Their dance. Um, <laughs> Tora Martin, that is interesting. He was just compared to a flower, right? Um, so it, he's like a bunch of blue forget-me-nots with, with green stems, right? Yeah. Um, uh, by the way, that would make a good, uh, I mean, if you can swing it, that would be a pretty fun Halloween costume, wouldn't it? <laughs> you know, just get a nice, like, 1970s baby blue leisure uh, suit and some bright green socks and be like, and then just, like, caper, you know. Uh, I mean, you'd probably get you'd probably get evicted from some places and possibly put on neighborhood watch lists, but it would still be a really good costume. Um, <laughs> yeah. So the singing fox was asking if uh, Tom Bombadil is dressing up as a flower uh, for his flower wife. I well, you know, he's compared to a flower here, right? So, uh, um, you know, that seems uh, that seems. Uh, you know, an interesting kind of connection there. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Karina says that the color choice sort of confirms her belief that Tom has reddish hair because that would be a fabulous color choice for a red. What the, the like baby blue leisure suit kind of look. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That would be good. And yes, Tony, she does wear forget me nots in her belt as well. Yes. Yes. Um, or at least in the other one, that, the other girdle that she was wearing. Um, Mad Vyuna says her shoes are like fish's mail and is wondering if this is a mermaid call out. Um, somebody can look it up if you oh if if anybody who has the uh, the Adventures of Tom Bombadil handy, look it up. I'm pretty sure that Princess Me, in the poem named Princess Me. Oops, sorry, lost my. Uh, Log in here. Um, I'm, pr yeah. I'm pretty sure that Princess Me has shoes with uh, scales like fish's mail. I think that's yeah, Karita, that's right. Okay, yeah, I was pretty sure I remembered that that shoe detail um, from Princess Me. In other words, it's a fairy thing, not necessarily a mermaid thing. Of course, obviously, mermaids wouldn't have uh, feet exactly at all, um, but. Uh, but I, yeah, I think that it seems to be a, there it is. See, that's what I thought. And her slippers frail of fish's mail flashed as she went by. There you go. There you go. Thank you, Tungo. Actually quoting the poem. That's, a, that's, that's very good. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. So um, I think that's, It's not like that's a reference Tolkien's going to expect anybody to get, right? But the fact that he's recycling that detail from Princess Me, which was originally published as Princess Ni, nee, as I recall way back, I'm pretty sure he wrote that poem ages ago, like in the teens, um, late teens, possibly. I think it was published in the 20s. Um, so that, po that poem, Princess Ni, nee, is way older. It's well, way older. It's uh, significantly older than The Adventures of Tom Bombadil. Um, so again, yeah, it's, um, it's, it's a, it's a fairy thing. Um, no, no, Brandon, Princess Nee does not have any knights who say anything as it happens. Just, just for clarification there. Um, yeah, yeah. And Karita is absolutely right. Several of you are referring to the fact that you you are contemplating actual uh, Tom Bombadil and Goldberry uh, uh, cosplay. In which case, you absolutely do need to make sure that you tweet that uh, to me and to uh, uh, and to Myth Guardian because that uh, needs to that needs to be in circulation. <laughs> anyway, okay. Um, so. 
I want to focus on the dancing here, right? Notice the emphasis. Notice that the emphasis is on the combination of wonder and laughter, the combination of Goldberry's grace and the merriment and oddity of Tom's capering, right? So he is funny, right? He's humorous in a not exactly clumsy, but he's he's his caperings are odd. Uh, right now, that's an impression, of course, we get from the very beginning, all this leaping and bounding. And, you know, I, you know, it's one of the things that I said from the very beginning. One of the reasons that I always, you know, I, I think I've said this before. The very, very first thing that I remember crossing my mind when I first heard that Peter Jackson was, you know, that like Lord of the Rings adaptations were forthcoming when I first heard it back in 1999 or something like that um, was they're totally going to cut Tom Bombadil. Uh, and the reason I thought that was that I had this, you know, picture of like, how do you do a visual adaptation of Tom Bombadil? Like if you just, if you put him on screen and made him act exactly as it's described in the book, he would look like a complete moron. I mean, it, he would, it would look really questionable. Um, it would be really hard to take that guy seriously. Um, now it's a, an effect. I think the effect of Tom Bombadil is easier to create in uh, in print than it is on screen in this way. Um, but anyway, it would be it would be it would be challenging. Um, but remember, like he kind of does look like a moron, right? I mean, like he's merry and odd, right? So he's uh, you know odd is odd is important. Right. Um, he looks strange. It's not it's not like it's normal. Right. She is a great dancer. He's not a great dancer. He's just a merry dancer. Right. A merry but odd dancer. Um, and, uh, you know, like that's cool, too, and everything. But I, but notice that. Um, yes, Marianne, I, I agree. I think it's really important that he doesn't care if he looks foolish. Right. The the sort of abandonment to merriment that he dis, that he displays seems to me important. Right. Uh, and. But notice what. Tolkien emphasizes here, um, because this is something that hasn't necessarily been said explicitly to this point, And that is the two of them fit together. They work together, right? They're not mismatched. In some ways, they seem mismatched, Tom Bombadil and Goldberry, right? She is all grace and elegance, and, and you know, they are they are awed whenever they look at her. They are A-W-E-D when they look at her. They just find Tom O-D-D, right? Um, there's odd, and then there's odd, and uh, he's strange. And yes, Stephanie, they don't hinder each other. You would think that if one person is extremely elegant and uh, uh, and graceful, and the other one is just like leaping and capering, that that wouldn't necessarily sort well together, right? But what we're told is the two of them fit together perfectly. In some fashion, they seemed to weave a single dance, neither hindering the other, in and out of the room and round about the table, and with great speed, food and vessels and lights were set in order. Right? So it's not just that that they don't, you know, that they um they the contrast is important. But it's not just that the con the contrast isn't a contradiction that it actually blends and joins together. Um, and it's functional as well, right? The dance that they're doing is the the dance of hospitality, right? As they're serving with great speed and efficiency, their guests. Um, yeah, yeah. You know, Brandon, you're right. Odd and Odd would make a great title for the Exploring the Lord of the Rings chapter about this section. Make a note of that somewhere, Brandon. We gotta we gotta remember that. That's a good that, that that's a good call right there. Um Yeah, yeah. Um Yeah, cool. Um 
notice how the hobbits are revived. It, in a sense, it takes them a while to revive, right? They achieve the same merriment and high spirits that they had on the previous evening's supper, right? When they were first welcomed to the house, but they don't get there immediately, right? They transition from fear and uncertainty, right? Uh, through to the observation of the unusual intricacy of their dance to hunger, right? And satisfying of hunger and through, through the food, uh, to uh, high spirits again, and then eventually their voices ring out in mirth and laughter. So they start to join in and start singing again as well. Um, yeah. After they had eaten, Goldberry sang many songs for them, songs that began merrily in the hills and fell softly down into silence. And in the silences, they saw in their minds pools and waters wider than any they had known. And looking into them, they saw the sky below them and the stars like jewels in the depths. Then once more she wished them each good night and left them by the fireside. But Tom now seemed wide awake and plied them with questions. Now, um, one thing that uh, just to... She seems to be associated with the river here, right? That is, her song... Um, where, where, where does her song take them, right? Well, it, it begins merrily in the hills and falls softly down into silence, into pools and wide waters, right? It sounds like the progress of a, of a little hill stream, right? Um, but, so, I, sometimes some of you are, are sort of thinking, well, hang on a second. When we see her being associated with the river here, does that suggest that our interpretation of her being associated with the uh, with the, the flowers and the, you know, the water lilies is incorrect. Is that, is this like, you know, counter evidence against that claim? I don't think so. Um, and the re here's the reason I don't think that. First of all, let's not forget. What is she called? What's her title, right? Daughter of the river, right? She is the daughter of the river. Whether she's associated with flowers or not, her mom is the river. And the river is her home, was her home, until she married Tom Bombadil. You remember in the poem that we talked about on Saturday, um, you know, he tells her to go back to her home deep under the under the willow roots, right? Um, so that she knows the life of the river and can tell them of the life of the river is no surprise, and that she does so doesn't uh, I mean, so is she associated with the river? Well, yeah, she's still going to be associated with the river, right? Um, uh, no matter what, right? Um, yeah, so I, uh, I'm i not sort of troubled by that. I think that we, we still need to see her uh, um, being in close connection with the rivers in this way. Um but uh, yeah, so the stars, yeah, I think the, 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 the suggestion, I do think the stars like jewels in the depths that, that th this is the stars being reflected in the, the wide pools uh, where the river ends, but, um, or the stream ends. But of course it is really kind of interesting since this is, her song is sort of bringing us along with the river. Um, Stars only look like jewels in the depths of a pool when you're looking at them, <clears throat> excuse me, from above, right? Um, so there's a sense in which the stars being like jewels in the depths of the pool is not, it's not actually giving us that from the river's point of view, right? Um, her songs are leading them to see in their minds pools and waters wider than any they had known. And looking into them, they see the sky below them and the stars like jewels. So they are looking down on the pools. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I'm not sure. Um, is this from the rain's point of view? In, in essence, are, are we getting like a Beginning in the hills and falling softly down into silence makes me think of makes me think of rain as well. Um, yeah, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, 
Yeah. Yeah. Um, Yeah, I think they have to be looking down into the pools and seeing the reflection of the sky below them in the pools so that the stars look like jewels in the depths. I think that has to be a reflection thing. But I agree, Irendis and Fourth Dauntless was pointing this out before too. It's hard not to think of Helid Zaram, right? And Tony Mead says it makes him think of Quivienen as well. Um, yeah, I wonder, um, in what sense are the pools and waters that they're looking at in her songs wider than any they had known, right? Um, because they've seen rivers and ponds. I guess they've probably never seen a, a lake, like a, a large lake, right? Um, but wider than any they had known sounds a little bit more uh, grandiose than that. Um but it's interesting to me in any case that Goldberry takes them. She sings her song. So he's told his stories and now she's singing her songs, which seems to be having an enchanting effect upon the hobbits again. Right. Um, and they're being brought. Um, uh, yeah. Yeah. Uh, uh, Arthur's agreeing with Tony about singing you know, that line about the, the waters wider than any they had known is making uh, him think of, uh, of, of Quivianen as well with the, the sort of mythic wonder associated with the waters of awakening. Right. Um, that is, uh, that is possible. Um, so yeah, uh, mad violinist, the brandy wine will eventually go down and, and, uh, and the, its waters will find the sea, but the hobbits have never been there. Right. They've never seen the sea. Um, there's a lake not too far North of them. Right. Um, uh, like even dim, but they've never been there either. Uh, so yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, uh, there's uh, very few hobbits who have been up as far as Lake even Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway, but okay. Hang on. But before I, pa I, I leave this, it's interesting that we're transitioning back into that. He sort of brought them to this elevation of, of wonder and imagination right in his own stories with the enchantment that he wove then goldberry comes in and she kind of breaks that spell right um her arrival breaks the spell and then tom jumps up and lights his candle and then they're bounding and they're dancing and they're serving dinner and you know goldberry signals the transition to merriment right and uh more song of course but um you know, the merry song of, of, uh, you know, around the dinner table. And now she's singing songs after dinner. And these songs seem to be taking them right back to that area of the contemplation of, uh, you know, of the wondrous again. Um, yeah. See, Matt, I was kind of thinking in that direction too, toying with that idea, at least. I'm not sure if I'm convinced of it. Um, but Matt was just thinking, is it possible that they're sort of experiencing the rain? Um, the clouds would begin in the hills and the rain would fall into silence. And uh, from there, from the rain, from the clouds, they can look down into the pools. Uh, it's exactly the looking down and, and the context of Goldberry's washing day that, uh, um, and she's just said the new waters are flowing down the hill under the stars, right? That um, that's exactly why I was kind of already thinking in that direction too, but I'm not sure I'm totally sold on it, but, um, but I think it's certainly, uh, it's certainly possible. Um, anyway, sorry, let's keep going. He, he appeared already to know much about them because all right, Tom is plying them with questions. He appeared already to know much about them and all their families and indeed to know much of all the history and doings of the Shire down from days hardly remembered among the hobbits themselves. It no longer surprised them, but he made no secret that he owed his recent knowledge largely to farmer Maggot, whom he seemed to regard as a person of more importance than they had imagined. There is earth under his old feet, and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones, and both his eyes are open, said Tom. It was also clear that Tom had dealings with the elves, and it seemed that in some fashion news had reached him from Gildor concerning the flight of Frodo. We have no idea in what fashion news has reached Tom Bombadil from Gildor. Um, I am not sure... 
what the candidates are for the fashion in which Tom received his news from Gildor. Um, I can think of, I would put them into three kind of categories, right? Um, <laughs> sorry, seeing Tom saying maggot, his eyes open. Um, yeah, see, that would have a very, very particular application, right? Um, so there could be an elf messenger who came through, right? There could be messenger birds or beasts that have come through and delivered the message to Tom, or there could be some just kind of more uncertain kind of telepathic message that was sent somehow by Gildor and received somehow by Tom. Um, I think in most of my readings in my life, I had always assumed the latter in some very vague sense. Um, I don't think that most probable. <clears throat> I suspect that the elf messenger, that seems to me to be the, the least likely, right? Matt, you're right. Trees. We should include trees as among the, uh, the, the candidates there in that sort of second category. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I doubt it was the moths. Uh, contrary to, uh, uh, the opinion of some, I really don't think that moths can make very good messengers. They just don't fly very far or very fast, really. Um, but anyway, okay. Uh, so yeah, I think it's probably either, um, uh, it was the fox, says Cass. <laughs> yeah, quite, quite possibly. Um, I think it couldn't be, have been a messenger. I mean, it could have been. We don't really know. I mean, um, in some fashion, news had reached him. Um, that just really means he didn't tell him, right, uh, how he heard. Um, but I do think that... Um, uh... <laughs> oh, very good. Very good. Yeah. Um, uh, Boomfle, yeah. Uh, or Boomful. I, I don't even... I. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce your, your name. Um, some bird, he heard elves singing about the hob about hobbits and told Tom. Yeah, that seems very likely. Um, so anyway, uh, you know, we'll have to, we'll have to see, we'll get, I think a little bit more evidence about this. So we'll see, uh, uh, what we know about this. Marielle, it does sound like Gildor's elves know who Tom is. Um, unless Gildor has just put out some kind of, you know, Wilderland APB, you know, and just like, like broadcast this everywhere that, you know, the, um, but that seems a little bit unlikely, right? It seems likelier that messages, uh, would be sent boomful. Okay. All right. Got it. Um, uh, yeah. So I think it's, um, uh, I think it's got, there's, there, there there's gotta be messengers being sent. Pro I mean, I think they're probably messengers sent. Um, and, uh, and that Tom would receive one, uh, is interesting. Interesting to me because Elrond has like half forgotten him. Right. But Gildor who travels around here, probably, I mean, Elrond hasn't been out this way in a couple thousand years. Uh, whereas Gildor has, um, so, uh, yes, exactly. Irindus, they were traveling East, so they, they might've passed through or close to the old forest. Yes. Um, Absolutely. Yeah, they could actually have come past. So it's possible that just an elf messenger, even Gildor himself, maybe. Um, but uh, yes, Marianne, I was also remembering that Gildor said that he would send out uh, that he would send out messages. Um, yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Farmer Maggot, his eyes open. There's earth under his feet, his old feet and clay on his fingers, wisdom in his bones and both his eyes are open. Um, we don't, we don't know, um, oh wait, hang on a second. Lincoln, that's a really good point. Lincoln points out that Tom Bombadil says that he was expecting the hobbits. Um, he just didn't know that they were there at the willow when he came by because he was on his way to the water lilies. Um. So is it possible that he heard about them from the elves 
and was on the lookout for them because he had heard messages from Gildor. In retrospect, Lincoln, that seems kind of likely, doesn't it? I mean, of course, it also seems quite likely that he would simply have been aware of them anyway, um, uh, just because he was in touch with what was what's going on uh, in the forest. Um, probably someone, a bird or someone would have, I mean, again, in Bombadil Goes Boating, we can see that Tolkien is conceiving Tom as being in much open conversation with the animals of the old forest, right? So doubtless some kind of tattletale willow wren or, or other has come to him, right, to tell him about uh, hobbits wandering in the forest and getting snared by old, you know, and, and falling into old man willow's snares. Um, so I would think he would have heard anyway. I don't think that proves it, but it is interesting in light of the fact that he seems to have heard something about that. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, exactly, Lincoln. I think it was probably the Willow Wren. Um, his praise... So, by the way, how often does he go into the Shire? You know, how does he talk to Farmer Maggot? I don't really know. You know, the scene that we get, and I talked about this some on Saturday, the scene that we get in Bombadil Goes Boating, that sequel poem that Tolkien wrote after The Lord of the Rings, um, I can't imagine that that poem is designed to take place prior to, chronologically prior to The Lord of the Rings, just because those Buckland hobbits down at Hayes End, uh, where he emerges from the forest, seem to be very familiar with him and comfortable with him. And if those hobbits down there know him so well and are on such friendly terms with him that they can shoot his hat full of arrows as a joke, I can't imagine Mary would not have heard of him. It's just really hard for me to imagine Mary Brandybuck being ignorant of the existence of Tom Bombadil if he's like a local figure, right? Um, that's why I had always imagined that Bombadil Goes Boating was depicting for us a a subsequent time that you know after this meeting with Frodo and Sam and Merry and Pippin he begins to become more open in his journeys into the Shire and develops this relationship with the hobbits and of course with Farmer Maggot um yeah um so um yeah exactly Eric Hebb, that's what I would expect. You know, I would expect that Mary would say something like, oh, you're that funny fellow my cousins like to take pot shots at. Yeah, I mean, he can't have not heard about that. I, I, he can't have not not have heard about that. Um, so, yeah, see, but Mungley, even if he didn't participate, I can't imagine that he would, that he, that he it, it would be totally unknown to him, right? Um, so, uh, yeah, yeah. Anyway, um, does this mean that Farmer Maggot himself goes into the forest. That seems to me more likely, frankly, uh, more likely than that. Tom, or maybe Tom Bombadil just comes out and isn't seen. Remember, in Bombadil Goes Boating, he's asking himself, how shall I go? Right. And decides, ah, I'll take the, I'll take a boat. And it's obviously not the, the accustomed and normal way. Uh, you know, it's not like he goes that way every time. Because of the way you can tell, because of the way that his animal friends, you know, the otter especially, uh, are like making comments about it. They're like, "Oh, Tom, you've become a boatman now, right?" Uh, so it's obviously not a, a normal thing. It's uh, a breaking of his ha of his pattern in some way. Um, and yes, Matt, I do think that Maggot seems like the kind who would brave the old forest from time to time. It doesn't seem to me at all strange to think that maggot might sometimes go into the old forest um if i were if i were making that story up right if i were trying to explain the backstory of that the story that seems to me to fit the characters and the overall facts best would be something along the lines of farmer maggot in his wild youth even the his relationship with frodo during frodo's wild youth suggests to me that Farmer Maggot had a wild youth too, especially the way that he looks back on it with Frodo when Frodo comes back as an adult, right? Um, I, I always hear at least some element of like, 
you know, I did some things back in my day too, right? I had to, I had to be firm with you when you were a kid because, you know, uh, like I can't have you trespassing, but you know, like I'm not going to hold it against you as a grown up because we've all been there, right? That's always had the sort of the spirit in which I understood um, uh, his conversation with Frodo there. So my my guess would be Farmer Maggot in his youth went into the old forest, you know, on a lark, on a dare, you know, to prove himself or whatever, and encountered Tom Bombadil. Um, and then has been, and having met him, goes back to uh, to visit occasionally. Um, so that's uh, that's my that's my theory. That's my theory. And yes, for those of you who are either joining us late or who weren't around for it, I talked about both of the Tom Bombadil poems, both the early poem and the later poem, at a special session I did during our webathon that will be posted uh, within the next couple days. Uh, so you can catch up on that if you missed it. Um, yeah, okay. Let's keep going. We're totally going to make it. Indeed, so much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, that Frodo found himself telling him more about Bilbo and his own hopes and fears than he had told before even to Gandalf. Tom wagged his head up and down, and there was a glint in his eyes when he heard of the riders. "'Show me the precious ring,' he said suddenly in the midst of the story, and Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket, and unfastening the ring, handed it at once to Tom." It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown-skinned hand. Then suddenly he put it to his eye and laughed. For a second the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Then Tom put the ring round the end of his little finger and held it up to the candlelight. For a moment the hobbits noticed nothing strange about this. Then they gasped. There was no sign of Tom disappearing. Tom laughed again, and then he spun the ring in the air, and it vanished with a flash. Frodo gave a cry, and Tom leaned forward and handed it back to him with a smile. Okay. Um, lots of really interesting things here, right? Okay. Um, yes, JJ, isn't it cool that he calls the ring precious, right? Um, there seems to be just a world of acknowledgement uh, it's like there's like a world of knowingness in that statement. Show me the precious ring, right? Um, knowing the significance of it, you know, the importance to hide it, um, knowing the um, even the, that the whole preciousness trend, right? The fact, the way in which uh, the perceived preciousness of the ring is associated with the hold that the ring has over its wielders, right? As if he's speaking even in sympathy for that. Um, let's start at the top. You guys are having some great observations here, but we're talking about five different things at once. First paragraph. Dime, what you were just talking about. Um, why does Frodo tell him more than he tells to Gandalf? So much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, that Frodo found himself telling more, telling him more about Bilbo and his own hopes and fears than he had told before even to Gandalf. Tom wagged his head up and down. Right, he's not just nodding, he's wagging his head up and down. And there was a glint in his eyes. Uh when he heard of the riders. Okay. Um, yeah. And uh, I'm not sure how to pronounce your name. Matheson there. Um, uh, I agree that I think there's not exactly, I'm not sure I, I, I'd say sarcasm exactly, but that there's an element of, uh, I don't know. I, I don't know if I'd go. I think there's a little bit of irony. Right. He doesn't consider it precious, but he acknowledges that Frodo feels that it's precious and he acknowledges that Gildor and Gandalf obviously consider it precious. So I think that there is a little bit of an edge. Again, not exactly sarcasm, but something like that, something 
I don't know, a cousin of sarcasm in any case. Um, Rhinus. Yeah. Mungly, that might be a better way to think of it. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, Matt, I think that you're onto it there. Why does he say, um, why does he say more to Tom? Why does he tell Tom more than Gandalf does? Cause Gandalf doesn't ask. Right. Um, Gandalf, what is Gandalf focused on? Gandalf is focused on the quest and the ring, right? Keep it safe and keep it secret. That's what Gandalf talks about. What does Tom talk about? Tom asks about him, about Frodo, about his own hopes and fears, right? And he finds himself sharing with him what his hopes and fears are, which don't necessarily have anything to do with the ring exactly, right? Um, it has to do with Bilbo, his fears about Bilbo, his hopes for me finding Bilbo again. Remember, we saw a moment when he refrained from telling Gandalf about that, right? Um, the desire comes over him to go and find and maybe find Bilbo again. And he 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 doesn't tell Gandalf that he has that thought, right? His only words to Gandalf are acknowledging that he will undertake the quest, right, to bring the ring to Rivendell. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, your right fourth thought was that Gandalf does inquire closely into Frodo and his doings, small matters of his health, remember, right? Um, but that's not the same thing as his hopes and fears. Um, you're right, he is trying to diagnose the rings, the extent of the ring's influence on Frodo. Um, but again, that's a ways away from actually just kind of trying to find out what Frodo's own hopes and fears are. I think there's a sense in which Tom Bombadil's conversation with Frodo here is sort of more personal, right? Less professional. Professional in like the physician sense. Uh, remember what Gandalf says to Bilbo, right? When, when he says to Bilbo, I was professionally interested in your ring, you might say, and I still am. Right. Professionally, just now, I'm not saying that Gandalf doesn't care about Frodo, you know, that Gandalf is, uh, uh, you know, it's, he does care about Frodo. He clearly feels that Frodo is his friend. But first and foremost, Gandalf is professionally interested in the ring. Right. Um, Tom Bombadil is not professionally interested in the ring. Right. He's interested in Frodo. Um, and then he asks him, apropos of nothing. Right. Suddenly in the midst of the story, he interrupts with show me the precious ring. Um, now, somebody was asking before. Um, yeah, exactly. Tony, you're right. Gandalf doesn't go out of his way to make Frodo comfortable. He's concerned with impressing on him the threat and danger. Yes, you need to be aware. You need to take this seriously. You need to be concerned. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Several of you are reporting that when you first read this, you thought that Tom was deceiving them and that he just wanted that he was trying to trick the ring away from him, that the ring was corrupting even Tom Bombadil. Um, Aragorn, that's a great question. Did Frodo even mention the ring yet or did Tom already know about it? Um, it's He doesn't say it explicitly, right? Um so much did Tom know, and so cunning was his questioning, it sounds like that could go to that Frodo found him telling him even about the ring, right? But that's not what he tells him about. He tells him about his hopes and fears. Um, so we're not told that the ring has explicitly come. Now, we know that Gildor's message that, you know, Frodo is abroad bearing a great burden without guidance um, has come to, but not what the burden is. Remember, Gildor doesn't know. He's not told. He doesn't want to know. Um, but... Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, Tom, I, I do have to wonder what Frodo said immediately before Tom asked to see the ring. Um, I said apropos of nothing. Well, apropos of nothing, we're told, but I, I suppose it wasn't apropos of nothing. Cause look, look carefully at what happens here. First, as a couple of you observed before, he gives a command: "Show me the precious ring." He doesn't just say, "Can I see it?" He says, "Show it to me." And look what happens. 
and Frodo, to his own astonishment, drew out the chain from his pocket and unfastened the ring and handed it at once to Tom. That is, I think, very significant. Right? Um, very significant. Because... Notice the two things that the narrator stresses. A, Frodo's astonishment at his own drawing out the chain, the, the, the chain and taking the, and giving it. He's astonished that he does it. And we're told that he does it at once. No pause, no hesitation. Remember what happened when Frodo was going to chuck the ring in the fire, right? What did he do? Paused, hesitated looked at the ring and that was one of the places where we saw that he uh, uh, where we saw him most under the influence of the ring's power right and yes Marianne Frodo was reluctant to give it to Gandalf um, he doesn't show any reluctance here and Kimber I agree with you um, this is uh, um Tom seems to be speaking words of command here. Exactly, Book Specs. Tom's the master, right? He has made a command, and he's given a command, and, and Frodo responds. Just like he did when Tom said, Whoa there! And he stopped, right? To his own astonishment, right? Screeches to a halt in the path. Um, Tom's words do have power over others. Um, over the wills of others, yeah, Tony, I mean, in a sense, it's almost like they circumvent their wills, right? Um, he, he doesn't have the power to manipulate their will, but to go around it, right? Um, Eric wants to know if he really would dominate Frodo here. My, I say yes. Now, here's why. First of all, the scene that I can't help but contrast this to is the one I've just been bringing up back in chapter two, when Frodo was told to chuck the ring in the fire and he couldn't, when he was re reluctant to give it to Gandalf, right? And Gandalf chucked it in the fire. Um, the His lack of hesitation in handing it over is, in my opinion, uh, distinctly unlike, like pointedly unlike the previous scene, right? There's some reason why Frodo does not, not only does it, but doesn't hesitate in doing it. That's uncharacteristic. Not only uncharacteristic for Frodo in a sense, but uncharacteristic uh, uh, of the ring to allow him to do that. Um, so that's the one thing. Then we see Tom's interest in the ring. It seems to grow larger as it lay. Oh, and, and wait, no, even going back a step, show me the precious ring. Again, Tom's knowingness, his acknowledgement of the whole preciousness issue with the ring, right? Suggests to me that he knows, Tom knows the, the hold that the ring has over him. Why has he issued a command like this uh, and, and sort of compelled Frodo to hand it to him? Because he knows how hard it would be. for He's circumvented, he's made it easier for Frodo, right? Hand it over to me. In other words, Tom seems to short circuit. Frodo doesn't have any ring temptation here. Right. We don't get any kind of rationalizations, no thoughts flashing through his mind at all, other than astonishment at the fact that he doesn't have them. He just hands it over without thinking about it. Right. Um, and that seems to be what. Yeah, Tony's your, Tony, you're right. Gandalf does the same thing to Bilbo to snap him out of the ring spell. But Gandalf has to, Gandalf's doing that to Bilbo is much more clumsy. Right. He gives him a command and he 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 uh, he overrides his he at least helps or supports his will right but when he threatens him with gandalf the gray uncloaked he does he is threatening force at that time right um so um yeah yeah um so exactly i think that um this is tom tom wants to see the ring and he's i think in mercy overriding uh, Frodo's will, enabling Frodo just to hand it over in a way that Frodo himself would never have been able to do. And look what happens when he does so. It seemed to grow larger as it lay for a moment on his big brown-skinned hand. 
that's probably not an illusion, right? Tom's fingers are bigger than Frodo's. Tom is bigger than a hobbit, if not quite as big as one of the big people, right? He's going to have bigger hands and bigger fingers. So when we see the ring lying in Tom's palm, the first thing we see is the ring rolling out the red carpet. The ring being like, put me on, please, right? I would fit you. Uh, the ring is ready to take Tom Bombadil as, an, as its new master, right? That's how I read that first sentence. Then suddenly he put it to his eye and left. For a second, the hobbits had a vision, both comical and alarming, of his bright blue eye gleaming through a circle of gold. Right? Here's the eye of Bombadil. Right? Um, Tungal is wondering if he puts the ring to his eye to mock it. I don't... So, here's my here's the way I would approach that question, Tungal. For whose benefit... Is he putting the ring up to his eye? Is he putting the ring up to his eye for his own benefit? I want to see what it looks like through the ring. Is he putting up the ring to his eye for Frodo's benefit? Right? Like, whoa, my bright blue eye. Right? Seen through the ring. Um, or is he putting the ring up to his eye for the ring's benefit in some sense? Right. Is it is it a point that he's making about the ring itself? Um, that Tom's putting the ring up to his eye is some kind of mockery of Sauron. See, I mean, he's laughing, right? I think he's laughing. He's laughing at himself, right? He's laughing because he's enjoying what he's doing. Um, but yeah, I totally think he's mocking the eye of Sauron. You know, that that's... Um, remember, that's the symbol that Tolkien drew for the cover art of The Lord of the Rings. The gold ring with the eye of Sauron inside it, right? The red eye of Sauron. Um, so this is... Um, this is Tom Bombadil, like, mocking Sauron's corporate logo here, right? Um, and laughing, right? Laughing at himself for doing it, right? Like, finding the whole concept of his own um, bright blue eye replacing the ferocious red eye of Sauron. Like, that's kind of funny, right? Um, is it possible that he is that he accomplishes something by doing that, that it's not just a gesture, right? Like, Hey, look, it's the unsauron. Pretty cool. Huh? Uh, or does he accomplish something? Does he see something through the ring? Um, I don't really know. You know, I, 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 is he doing something to the ring in some sense? Like it seems possible. Um, he puts, the ring then on his finger and holds it up and there's no sign of Tom disappearing. Um, now, yeah, yeah. Um, yeah, Tom says he uh, uh, shows the ring to be a small thing from another perspective and that might be what, what he's trying to show Frodo. Yes, Tom Hillman, I I agree. I can't help but think that part of what he's doing is making a funny thing for Frodo, right? Frodo is thinking about the eye of Sauron, right? He is thinking about the enemy who is searching for him. And here's Tom with this like contrasting image, right? Picture my eye looking at you through it instead, right? Um, that may be a comforting thought, even if it's not. Yeah. Um, uh, uh, Trogon says, uh, yeah, he's giving Frodo confidence. It's like that, I think. Um, yeah, Fourth Dauntless, that is really interesting. Does the ring fit? Um, Fourth Dauntless is saying it, it looks like it doesn't fit because he's just putting it around the end of his little finger. I'm not sure. You know, I mean, rings... 
I mean, usually, of course, a ring isn't going to be, even if a, if a ring fits you, it's not going to be so big that if you put it on your finger, it'll just drop by gravity straight down, right? I mean, normally you've got a, you've got, if a ring fits properly, um, you, you, you have to kind of work it onto your finger. So I think that it's, uh, I think that that moment when he puts it just around the tip of his little finger is again him making a point. And I suspect that the ones he's making the point to are primarily Frodo and the other hobbits, but also maybe in a sense, the ring or Sauron. Um, By just putting it around the tip of his little finger, he's sort of, he's not committed to this concept. There's no question about whether or not he's claiming the ring for himself. Right. Um, Yeah. 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 And Eric, have I agree to some extent, the question of like him not becoming invisible, it shocks them because they don't really understand what it's about. Um, given the way the ring is explained later on, it makes all kinds of sense. Like how, why would Tom disappear? Right. Uh, you disappear when you're drawn into the Wraith world, but he's a spirit anyway. I mean, he's going to be native to that land. So I don't think, uh, um, I don't think that that's uh, that that's a big issue. Um, now I think you're right, Matheson, that he is making a, a a sort of a show of his own mastery in a sense. But I don't. But I I would agree with that. But I would qualify it in one way. Um, he's not showing off himself. I think he's putting down the ring, right? I think the message is not, "I'm all that." right? Even the ring of power can't control me, right? This is not Tom, like, flexing and showing off. This is Tom belittling the ring. Look at this little thing. Oh, look at my eye through the ring. Kind of scary. No, it isn't, is it? Right? Oh, look. Here, I'll put it on. What happens to me? Nothing, right? This ring, not that big a deal. That seems to me like, you know, the, oh, darn it, I forgot again. I'm losing myself in our, my, uh, our Tom Bombadil discussion here tonight. Um, I that's how I take that um, that uh, 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 his whole sort of display here, his whole demonstration. Um, yeah, yeah. Um, so yeah, no, I, I, I don't think uh, no Aragorn for the record. I think that if Gandalf or um, Galadriel or uh, Sauron put on the ring, I don't think they would become invisible. Um, I think that invisibility is something that only happens to those who do not dwell at once in both worlds, right? So, um, yeah, yeah. And Tungo, you're right. He's laughing throughout this. Again, this, that's why I'm getting belittling here, right? Um, that's why I'm getting belittling. Uh, he laughs again and he spins it in the air and makes it vanish. Right? Like, hey, look, I solved a ring problem. It's gone away. And then Tom leans forward and hands it back to him with a smile. Right? He's, this is just, Frodo's going to get offended at how he's treating it like a random, you know, little trinket. Right? Um, but that seems to me Tom Bombadil's entire point. Um JJ's wondering if this is pure sleight of hand or is there any real magic involved? Oh boy, you know, where do you draw those lines with somebody like Tom Bombadil, right? Um, yeah, I'm not sure that you can uh, that you can really go there, right? I'm not sure that we can really even make up our minds about that point. Um, yeah, and Matt, you're right to remind us that in belittling the ring, he's in part belittling and laughing at the whole idea of dominion, right? Um, it really shows his mastery to be of a totally different kind, right? He's not... Tom Bombadil does not get a ring-induced monologue, right? There is zero evidence that Tom Bombadil is even briefly tempted by the power that the ring has to offer. It's clear the ring is offering it. The resizing really suggests that to me, right? I am sure that the ring is doing its level best to attract Tom, to attract Tom Bombadil, but it's not working. Instead, he's like, whoa, look at me, right? I can look through it. Um, 
Yeah. <laughs> Here we go. We got it, Tony. I'm going to keep going. Um, because what I want to look at next is Frodo's response. Um, and this, again, I think really shows us a lot about Tom. Frodo looked at it closely and rather suspiciously, like one who has lent a trinket to a juggler. It was the same ring, or looked the same and weighed the same, for that ring had always seemed to Frodo to weigh strangely heavy in the hand. But something prompted him to make sure. He was perhaps a trifle annoyed with Tom for seeming to make so light of what even Gandalf thought so perilously important. He waited for an opportunity, when the talk was going again, and Tom was telling an absurd story about badgers and their queer ways. Then he slipped the ring on. Mary turned towards him to say something and gave a start and checked an exclamation. Frodo was delighted, in a way. It was his own ring, all right, for Mary was staring blankly at his chair and obviously could not see him. He got up and crept quietly away from the fireside towards the outer door. Okay, of course we get the Badger's cameo there, right? The only memory of the uh, Badger Brocks from Adventures of Tom Bombadil who capture him down in their tunnels, uh, like the goblins when he takes a, uh, when he seeks shelter in what seemed like a convenient cave and unused. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Cass, great point. Um, it was his own ring, all right. Yes, Cass, I think that's a very weighted phrase, right? One of the things that we see going on here is uh, Frodo... This description, this is, I think, the narrator being extremely subtle, right? The narrator is not, I think, being perfectly objective here. The narrator is giving us a glimpse of Frodo's own perspective, right? Just like the narrator did when it was giving us, when he was giving us Frodo's rationalization when he was going to put on the ring when the Black Rider was crawling through the grass, right? Um, uh, Gandalf's advice seemed absurd, right? He was still in the Shire. Um, you know, that stuff, that's... The narrator is just telling us that that's what's going on in Frodo's head, right? It doesn't even say, and then Frodo thought, right? That's not what it says. The narrator just observes. You know, Gandalf's advice seemed absurd. Here, what we see going on in Frodo's mind. He is suspiciously looking at it, right? So notice his very first thought is, wait, has, did Tom Bombadil steal the ring? Right? There's a certain level of possessiveness there already, right? He, this is my ring, right? He's not trying to pass me off a fake because that would mean, like, that's how a thief would do it, right? They'd be like, oh, can I borrow it? Oh, sleight of hand, here's your ring back, right? So, I mean, if Tom had, like, malicious intent, that's totally how he would do it. That kind of very suspicious um, line of thinking is very possessive, right? And of course, perfectly unfitting anything he has seen about Tom Bombadil. Um, so, that, and then, Brandon, you're absolutely right. Um, he's completely missing the point of what he is not buying what Tom is selling, right? That the ring is not a weighty thing. Weighty is immediately what he observes that it is, right? Ah, yes. This is my ring. This is, the, you can feel how weighty it is. This is an important ring, right? Um, but something prompted him to make sure. I don't know what could have prompted him to make sure. No, wait, I do know, right? This is, I think, another really clear indicator of the ring working on Frodo. I think this is the third time that we have had very clear evidence that Frodo is being worked on by the ring. This scene, the Gandalf's advice seemed absurd while the rider is coming towards him and uh, the time at the fireplace, right, back in chapter two. Um, so I think the ring is plainly influencing him, prompting him to make sure, put it on, put it on, make sure this is your ring, right? And he's annoyed, annoyed that Tom is making light of the ring. So it's not that he's oblivious to Tom's message. He's just resistant to it. Right. No, this is this is not just like I, I don't buy that whole like the ring isn't a big deal thing. Right. Even Gandalf thinks it's important. That's a rationalization. Right. Um, and then he puts on the ring. 
knowing what it is, knowing what he's doing, right? This is the first time he's ever done that. The first time he's done, first time he's put on the ring since he's known it was a ring of power. He's delighted. It, and then as Cass was pointing out, it was his own ring. All right. Very alarming, especially as a follow-up to his obeying the prompting of the ring, right? Um, yeah, Matt is asking, is Frodo annoyed or is the ring annoyed at being rejected and it's influencing Frodo? I think the annoyance is Frodo's annoyance, but I do think that his annoyance is under the influence, is, you know, under the influence of the ring, he's feeling annoyed. Or that that's how those particular thoughts are kind of manifesting there. But now here's the important thing that I never really thought about enough. This is the thing that I was was really thinking about most in light of this, um, in light of the, in, you know, in, in, in this reading through. And after we, 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 uh, we look at this part, we'll be done. Where's he going? What's his plan? Putting on the ring to confirm that he's going to turn invisible and that it's really his ring is one thing, right? As soon as Mary turns and looks at him and doesn't see him, his test is complete. He's confirmed that it's his ring. Where's he going? Where is he going? Look what happens. Hey there, cried Tom, glancing towards him with the most seeing look in his shining eyes. Hey, come Frodo there. Where be you a-going? Old Tom Bombadil's not as blind as that yet. Take off your golden ring, your hands more fair without it. Come back, leave your game, and sit down beside me. We must talk a while more and think about the morning. Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Yeah, Link and I also like, uh, I'm not as blind as that yet. Uh, <laughs> the yet is kind of funny. Um, I'm eldest, right? But uh, But I'm not blind yet. Um, by the way, remember our long-term question that we're asking. One of the one of the uh, one of the big questions to which we are trying to gather evidence as we go through is: Is the ring sentient or not? I don't see any clear evidence here that it is. We see Frodo being influenced. Frodo seeming to be manipulated in some ways, but it. All of these things could be triggered. His annoyance, his suspicion, followed by his annoyance, his desire to confirm, um, all of those things, his pleasure and his, you know, could, to me, could be explained by feelings of possessiveness, right? His desire to possess the ring. Um, all of those things seem like that. But Tom stops him. Hey there. Hey, come Frodo there. Where be you a-going? That's the question. Where was he going? What would have happened? What would have happened if Tom hadn't called him back? When, where would he have gone? When would he have stopped? I realize uh, that I never ask that question, right? I don't... Um, I don't know where he would have gone. What impulse exactly he was obeying. We can see it all the way up through there, right? We can see the impulses that he's obeying in his suspicion and his desire to confirm, but he's already confirmed, right? Why is he leaving? Um, and yes, yes, Brandon, exactly. Tom segues smoothly from leave your game and sit beside me to Tom must teach the right road and keep your feet from wandering. Well, wandering are what his feet were certainly just doing. Um, yeah. Tom can see. So we started with Tom's eye, right? With the, we started the ring sequence here with Tom's eye looking through the ring. And we see, what do we see? Tom can literally see through the ring. And I think this is true in lots of ways, 
right? He, he not only can see through it when he holds it up to his eye, he can see through it in the sense of seeing through its effects. The invisibility that is given by the ring doesn't affect him. He can see through the ring's invisibility and see Frodo perfectly clearly and the ring on his hand, right? Um, he can also, I think, see through it in the sense of see how it is affecting Frodo, right? Um, this is why I think that he gives his command, show me the, why he springs the command on Frodo, show me the precious ring, right? Um, and the, the motions, the astonishment, you know, the, the automatic, uh, handing it over at once, um, suggests to me very strongly that he has compelled Frodo because I think he sees through that. He knows, he knows how the ring is affecting Frodo. Um, and he's assisting him to hand it over. And now he's assisting him again. He can see, not just he can see Frodo, he can see what's going on. I don't know where Frodo's going. I don't think Frodo knows where he's going. But Tom, in a sense, I think, does see where he's going. And that's why he he says, where be you a-going? Because he's like bringing it up as a question to Frodo, challenging Frodo. Frodo, do you know what you're doing right now? Frodo, are you in control right now? Right? Um, and of course, because Tom sees him and asks these questions, Frodo recovers himself, right? Frodo laughed, trying to feel pleased, and taking off the ring, he came and sat down again. Um, he recovers. He removes the ring. He rejoins the table, right? Um, but, uh, but yeah, Tim, I agree. In a sense, this isn't like an intervention from Tom. I, 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 I really think so. He's not stepping he's not going to take the ring away he's not going to take over the ring right he's not going to he's not going to alter frodo's quest he's not going to remove it from frodo's charge but irindis yeah she says it's a very gentle way to scold frodo i i yes i agree it's certainly very gentle but i'm not sure it's exactly scolding yes tony it seems to me more like breaking the spell um i think he's helping Frodo here, um, and helping Frodo to see that he is not in control. And I think that Frodo sees that. Remember, Frodo is trying to feel pleased, right? To think that he's part of the joke here, but he's uncomfortable. He's uncomfortable while he's laughing at what happened. Um, and I think that that, um, uh, discomfort, that Frodo feels is com is complicated. I think it's complicated. I think he's uncomfortable. Part of him is uncomfortable because he's still under the influence of the ring. I'm not sure. I think, sorry. <laughs> I think that, sorry. So I just got an Apple watch. I've never had one before and I'm wearing it for, this is the first day I'm wearing it. And I just accidentally hit something and Siri started talking. My apologies. <laughs> anyway, I think that in part Frodo is, is embarrassed is trying to feel pleased he's he's feeling embarrassed because he's still under because he's 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 he acknowledged it like what tom has done is worked right and he knows that he's acted badly so he's trying to like tom is very generously allowing him to pass it off as a joke right um but he uh um he is uh trying so he's trying to pass it off as a joke but he knows uh, what just happened is not totally okay, right? Um, so, I, you know, I, I think that that's um, part of it, but that's only part of it. Part of it, I think, also, is him still being under the influence of the ring. And he's trying to feel pleased at what happened, but he's not pleased at what happened because, like, again, part of him is grateful and embarrassed. Part of him is thwarted. Right. The part under the under the spell of the ring has been thwarted and he's trying to pass it off and be like, oh, yeah, that was all a good joke. We're all we're all happy with how that ended. Right. But I think part of him isn't happy with how that ended. Part of him wanted to go out and go wherever he was going to go. And I don't know where he was planning to go, but I do know where, where he would have ended up. Right. Where he would have ended up is in the clutches of the ring wraiths. That's where had he gone out. Um, that couldn't have ended well. Um, 
so uh yeah yeah um yeah um yeah anyway okay um Okay, even though I'm like a slide and a half away from the end of the chapter, I'm going to uh, stop here. But Matt asks a great question. I'll end with this. Um, any thoughts now that we've reached the end of the chapter on why Sam is silent while in the pre presence of Bombadil? Matt, my main thought about that is Sam was also silent in the presence of the elves, right? I think that, Tom, that Sam is good at the wonder thing right he's uh, he's good at the just sort of absorbing the marvelous when he is surrounded in it um i don't think he needs to talk um he's just kind of soaking it in um but um uh, yeah yeah um but i agree that uh uh, Marielle, I agree that your hands more fair without it becomes, is quite pointed, right? Um, that is the only thing that is a direct rebuke, right? But even that's very gentle, right? It's kind of more like advice. Like, in my opinion, your hand is more fair without it, right? Uh, you know, this is not shame on you, right? There's no element of that. It's, uh, you know, Frodo, um, your hand is more fair without the ring. Um, <laughs> Tom is theorizing that maybe Sam was just pretending to sleep like a log uh, and actually got up and had a conversation with uh, with uh, Tom and Goldberry later like he did with the elves. Um, right. Yeah, that's why Tom didn't or Sam didn't have nightmares because he was the only one who wasn't actually asleep at all. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, and JJ, you're right. Frodo neglected to kick him. So there you go. That was an oversight. Uh, yeah, yeah. Um, Cass asks, is Tom trying to ease Frodo's mind? Well, I don't know if I would say it that way. Take off your golden ring. Notice that's another imperative. It's another command, right? Is he, again assisting Frodo's will, like Gandalf tried to assist Bilbo's will, take off the ring, right? Um, Frodo laughed, and taking off the ring, he came and sat down again, right? So again, Frodo obeys right away, right? Did his will get a little boost to remove the ring there and to resist this temptation that the, um, that the, that the ring was, uh, you know, administering here? Uh, possibly. Possibly. Um, come back, leave your game, and sit down beside me. Um, yeah, yeah, Mike, you're right. Mike says he's sort of been keeping track. Tom has a 100% success rate when speaking in the imperative. Yeah, uh, Tom Bombadil... If you're in Tom Bombadil's patch and he says something in the uh, in the imperative mood, I think it pretty much happens. Um, yeah. Now, Deathman is suggesting that leave your game implies that he's talking to the ring, not Frodo. Maybe. I kind of think it's him being generous to Frodo. Um, he doesn't want to rebuke Frodo and be like, Frodo, how you're, you know... Frodo, you are in danger. Come back, Frodo. You know, like he doesn't make a big deal of it. Because remember, what was he just doing? Making light of the ring, right? Making an uh, making a small deal of the ring. And he and so too he makes a small deal of Frodo's temptation here. Um, he acknowledges it, right? Where be you a going? Can you even answer that question, Frodo? Have you thought about that? Um, leave your game and sit down beside me. Right? It's just this isn't like a life or death temptation to which you were giving in and which had you continued to give into it would have inevitably led to Sauron's recovery of the ring and the destruction of the world or anything. You're just having a little game, right? Surely that's, that's what was just happening there. 
Um, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, I think that he's being kind, but also giving cues to Frodo, right? Frodo, <laughs> think of it. You're better off thinking of this as a game. Right. And making light of the ring rather than taking it so darn seriously. Um, yeah. OK. Uh, Lincoln's correct that we still have a poem. So I'm not going to like we do have one more slide. So we're, this is this this last couple paragraphs will be our transition into chapter eight. So we didn't quite get to the very, very end, but we are super close. We are three and a half short paragraphs away from the end of the chapter. Uh, and this will be our transition into their departure and going off to the Barrow Downs at the beginning of chapter eight next time. All right. Well, thank you very much, everybody. I came pretty close. You have to admit. All right. So uh, we're going to, uh, I'm going to stop here. It's field trip time. I'm a little late for my field trip, but I was a little late for class. Uh, so sorry about that. Um, but, uh, so thanks everybody for joining us. Say, uh, uh, good night to the Twitter folks. We'll, we'll stick around on Twitch. Bye everybody on Twitter. And, uh, I will, uh, oh, so Matt won the betting pool, did he? About when we were going to end. All right. So we're going to, we're going to field trip. We're here on Arkenstone, uh, uh, tonight and we're going to go up. Uh, we're just going to ride straight tonight. So let's go out and meet by uh, uh, meet at the, the crossroads. Um, right. Let's just meet at the uh, Greenway and East Road crossroad around which Bree or near which Bree was constructed. Yeah, Tarlonio, at the end of the day, I'm not going to rush. Uh, I'm not going to rush that poem. Right. And the whole like Tom Bombadil setting up to, um, you know, setting up to to like have them summon him and everything like that's a that's a whole nother topic. And I, I, I want to I want to not rush that. I want to I wanted to get through talking about Tom in the ring. So I achieved my goal there. Uh it was, it was, it is a big, it's, I think it's, it's super important because of its prominence in how, um, in, in Frodo's ro relationship with the ring, it's easy to miss because Tom Bombadil succeeds in brushing it off. Right. But it's a big deal. Like it's a milestone in Frodo's relationship with the ring. Not to mention it causes like hours and hours of speculation, you know, among most, you know, not just yourself, many scholars. Yeah, absolutely. Tom and his nature. Absolutely, yeah. So, uh, Valori here, by the way. I'm on tonight as uh, Gautil, which I think is uh, Swedish for Merry Christmas. <laughs> I was tired. I was on cough medicine. I don't know. <laughs> ah, good. Oh, oh, right. Gautil, right, yes. Yes. Yeah. 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 Good Christmas. Okay. All right, are we? I'm good. And pine leaves here, excellent. All right, so are, are we ready? Can anybody else here come in? So I want to go north. We're not going to spend much time in the Breelands because we'll do a proper tour of the Breelands later on. Um, what I want to do is ride up the Greenway. Of course, the Greenway here is going to be ending at Fornos, but we're not going to get quite there. I want to get to the um, to the border here. So let's uh, let's mount up. So I got some. Stragglers coming out, but it's always hard to tell because there's so many people. All right, let's go ahead and head north up the Greenway. Even people at lower levels should be able to safely navigate the Greenway uh -huh. here. Yeah, I made it all the way up to uh, Esteldeen, and I'm 14, so... Okay. There we go. So the, uh, you know, the deer and, uh, and you know, innocent animals didn't come out of the out of the forest and hunt you down? No, surprisingly not, although, you know, <laughs> now that I say that, I probably jinxed it. <laughs> yeah. Boomful is, I am also interested in the state of the road. Now, we know it's called the Greenway because there's grass growing through it. So, you know, we know that it, it's, it's, we should not really expect to see 
you know, st a still a well-paved road. Uh, there's something on the... We get stars, right? Yeah, yeah, every now and then there's a star. Do we get trees or sh just stars? Just stars, right? Uh, I don't know, but I got my thing on the lowest graphic. <laughs> okay, yeah. No, I don't think we get stars. And the interesting thing about the blocks here on the Greenway mm -hmm. are that they're clearly partial. These are not just square... Pa like, these are... The stones clearly used to form a larger pattern. Unlike the unlike the paving stones that you can see down in Enidwyth, for instance, or Dunland, um, you can, like, and those were clearly those were tiles, right? Those particular stones. Um, you guys all behind me? Did you just stop and look at the stones? Uh, sorry, yeah, I stopped to yeah. look at the stones. I totally did. Uh, I'm busy trying to avoid bears here. Okay, so, sorry. All right, all right, we're coming. Sorry, we're coming. But anyway, yeah, you can see sure. when you look at these stones. You can see that they they seem to form part of a larger pattern. So the the impression that it gives is not these are the individual uh, like you know these stones are sort of self um, um, uh, self uh, you know contained um, and they used to be more tightly together. Rather, this was like part of a larger design that's now been lost and broken up. Uh, yeah. But you can by see the places grass. where there's been stones kicked out of place and put back in. Yes, exactly. Um, well, and you know, they might have been raided at some point. It's a stone taken up to build fortifications or yes, yes, hurled as weapons or whatever. Yeah, I'd be surprised that that hadn't happened to more stones if not for the fact that there's so many other ruins around here. They have, uh, you know, stonework is something that the local farmers and stuff have no shortage of if they need stone. Oh, yeah, and we don't know how wide this once was. This might have been considerably wider, and it's all been overgrown. I can't imagine having to plow up a field near this road, how much how much of that rock would have ended up under the plows. Right, right, exactly, exactly. Yeah. There's actually a bike path in my neighborhood called the Greenway. I always laugh every time we walk <laughs> on it. It's another old railroad line converted to a bike path. Yeah. So, uh, Brandon, the houses that we're passing by are mostly good guys, but we'll 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 come to that later. We'll look at the general sort of Brie layout and economy in the context of looking at Brie. Um, I'm trying to delay. Brie, of course, is one of the starter areas. I'm trying to delay actually talking about Brie until because we're going to get to Brie and the and oh, yeah. the Brie lands. Um, but of course, I have to put it off for a long time. But we're only one chapter away now, so I'm still I'm still confident we'll get to Bree by Christmas. Hello, cut out a bit there. Oh, sorry. Yeah, now I was just saying I'm confident we'll get to Bree by Christmas. Um, so uh, yeah, this is a. Uh, uh, oh wow, we've lost stones entirely here. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. not even a trace of them. Oh, that's interesting. As we right as we enter the wood there. Maybe the woods were once too tightly together to put a road in. Maybe. Or maybe the people of Trestlebridge, which is just up the road here, were a little bit more assiduous in gathering them up. Yeah, could be. Although I don't think that they'd have any do well, yep, there's the stones again. Just picked uh, up. They just picked up again, yeah, so that that would seem to defeat the Trestlebridge theory. Oh, I see some stars now stuck in the stones yes yeah but see those are like if you look at some of these like this one here right in front of my horse's head right there the star is off center and is broken in half right like clearly that stone is meant to sit next to other stones and many of most of them are off center none of them really just have a star in the middle of them it actually looks like a p a very lar much larger piece that was sort of pillaged and cut in pieces to furnish the stones Quite possibly. Or that it was originally meant to be a larger design. But... To be what? Sorry? To be... to be a, It was part of a larger design originally, and they've been kind of shifted and moved out of place and that kind of thing. Yeah. Good. Okay. So we're in Trestlebridge here, and we'll come back to the town of Trestlebridge and think about this town itself as a town um, in the Brelands as it is the very northern edge of the Brelands, um, as we're moving up into the North Downs. But 
This is what particularly interests me about Trestle Bridge, and that is the bridge. Yeah. So this I find to be a very cunning piece of a very cunning piece of um, uh, engineering. Of engineering, yes. But I'm thinking particularly of narrative engineering um, and of reflection upon the history and storylines. So if we look at the bridge for a moment, over here, right, it's stone. And this is one of those, like, dorky statues with the disproportionate sword, which I always think of, like, this was like a really unfortunate period uh, in the history of Dunedain art. Yeah, a lot of art was lost. <laughs> we see it in other places, right? And I'm like, uh, I, I think it... But anyway, one of the things that we can obviously see here when we look at this are the huge stone buttresses. So this wooden bridge is a very cunning wooden bridge, but it's clearly built on the stone bases of what was certainly a larger and grander bridge at some or time past that they couldn't save or was damaged by something. Yes, exactly. So presumably the stone span, because this looks like not even just a foundation. This actually looks like it was quite likely the span itself mm -hmm. down here. Um, you know, that it was just a stone arch that crossed right here and that this other whole superstructure was built on top of it. Um, <clears throat> so that they could use the original uh, base of the span uh, as an anchor for their wooden trestle bridge here. Um, but uh, anyway, um, so I take the, the wooden bridge to be a modern construction, but that there was a bridge here too. So now here we have, when I, when I reflect on trestle bridge, and in particular the, the actual span itself, it makes me think of, there are two different things. One, of course, is just the map. The map has a river running through here, right? So there's a river that comes down. If we go over to the Even Dim map, right, this is a branch off of the Brandywine uh, that is coming in. So the, the, the water's going to be flowing as we're looking down from this bank. It's going to be, the water should be flowing from left to right. Okay, it's not. It's flowing from right to left. Darn it. Okay, yeah. fine. That's fine. <laughs> I was wrong. Well, uh, topographical experts have questioned a lot of Tolkien's rivers, so I don't know. <laughs> right. Who knows? Anyway, okay, so fine. They have it flowing from... I guess that makes some sense from the map. If the water is flowing... If the Brandywine is flowing out of Evendim, it splits that way. So this is not a river flowing into the Brandywine, but a fork in the river. Whatever. But anyway, the point is we have this river, right? Okay, so, so first they have a river. Um, but the fact of them having a river does not mean that they, by whom I mean the game developers, have to make this into a huge, enormous gorge. What do they accomplish by making this into a huge, enormous gorge with a big old bridge across it? And well, it makes the bridge more impressive. <laughs> it does make the bridge more impressive. Um, but why have a bridge here at all? So this is where the, the other place where I feel that this plays a really interesting role in uh, the context of, of actually not even the appendices of what we're told in The Lord of the Rings. Um, this was really brought home to me when I first visited up here um, back when back when Wigand was just a, a wee little guardian um, and he crossed the trestle span for the first time. And of course, the first thing you encounter when you come over here are orcs, right? I mean, there's an orc camp. You can see it right up on the hilltop right there. That palisade, which is one orc camp, and there's another smaller orc camp right down over here. Um, oh, we're going over. Okay. <laughs> yeah, we're going over towards it here. I want to... Um, and there's apparently roving threats and things oh, near here. So that should be fun for you. Um <laughs> Anyway, so I'm not going to go too close because I don't want to draw all the orcs over to, to the newbies. But um, but anyway, the point is, so there's danger. There's right there. So here we have two orc camps, and there's Trestlebridge. Like, I can see the town from here, right? And surely from those buildings, they can see the fires of the orc camps right across the river over here on this side, right? Oh, yes. So how is it that we have a peaceful situation over here? Well, when I, when I was 
seeing this and thinking about this as I was playing the first time, I couldn't help but remember the line that um, uh, that Aragorn delivers in the Council of Elrond, right? When he talks, when he names himself Strider, right? And it says, Strider I am called, um, you know, to a man who lives a day's journey away from creatures that would freeze his heart if he were not ceaselessly guarded. And... Um, Exactly the way that uh, uh, just what T Joint was saying in the in the in the in the Twitch chat by making the river a gorge here, they make this point and Trestle Bridge itself into a key strategic point of defense. One question that kind of arises if you think about what Aragorn says, right? You, th- you think about what Aragorn says at the um, at the council. Yeah, how is that possible? Right? How do the Dunedain accomplish the protection of Bree? If if less than a day's journey north of Bree, there are creatures that would freeze uh, Butterbur's heart, and yet they are completely unknown to the Brewanders. Right? Like the, there aren't even rumors about them in the Brewands. Butterbur lives in utter ignorance of these horrible creatures who live so close by him. Remember. Buckland is more than a day's journey away from Hobbiton, right? So we're talking, about when he says a day's journey, we're talking, what, like the distance between, um, between, uh, uh, um, at, well, at most, you know, maybe if you're thinking on horseback, you could probably get to Buckland in a day. But but no further than that, right? You know, we're talking a really small distance that Aragorn is claiming there are serious enemies, um, but that those enemies are repelled or prevented from coming anywhere near the Breland by the Dunedain. How is that possible? How could they do that, right? Um, because they're not that numerous. It's not like, you know, the Dunedain have this, like, fighting front in the north, or that there are so many of them that they, as, as like, hunters, are continuously, um, you know, uh, hunting down all of these fell creatures, whatever, you know, unnamed creatures that are up here, um, yeah. and therefore prevent, you know, and, and not us. And there's so, so many of them and such good hunters that not a single one of them ever, you know, breaks through and comes down. Um, so again, the, I was remembering that line and just looking at the trestle span here and thinking about trestle bridge and the way that they have constructed this, it struck me as a very, very cunning way of solving that problem, right? Especially yeah. since as Tolkien describes, there's a river there. So yes, um, it would be perfectly wow. natural if there were dark and fearsome creatures, whether they're orcs or whatever that are up here in the North downs, um, the people of Trestle Bridge and south on into the Breedlands could easily be totally sheltered from them because this bridge becomes this one strategic choke point where and it's it's the only way to get from the it's North Downs down yeah, into the, the Breedlands. Yeah. Exactly. Um and so I really um I really like the the uh the concept, you know, that um uh you know that they and so it just you know I, I don't know if that was what was in the minds of the developers when they when they made this or not, um, but I think it works really well, um, and of course especially given as we all know, you know what the Dunedine primarily do in game up here, right? Which is sit by campfires. So um, you know, it, and that fits right. What 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 we see of how the Dunedine are depicted is their watchmen. Primarily, right? I mean, they, 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 they can fight, they can hunt. Um, occasionally, you know, even as a as a as as a player, you come across a Dunedain who will bestir himself occasionally and go on a quest with you. Um, but primarily, they're they're watchers, and that's yeah. We we yeah. made that joke before about the Dunedain actually not getting off their butts and doing much, but yeah, they 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 have. They have to secure, keep, make sure at all times places like this are secure. Right. Probably other key points in front of rivers and bridges and valleys, gorges and all that stuff. Yeah. So, yeah. They, they don't really have that luxury to run around and do, so they send us to do it. Right. Exactly. And even, you know, I'm, I'm thinking even of the the presence down in the Breland of like the whole brigand problem that they're developing down in the Breland. Even that seems like, um, 
it really fits within this picture, right? That the Dunedain are, are you know, they're they're primarily up here, right? And they're protecting the 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 the, the northern front up here, so that nothing from because uh, Fornost is haunted land, right? The, it, remember that Butterbur has heard enough about Fornost to call it haunted land, right? Yeah. Um, so he's heard some kinds of ghost stories or monster stories about the greater Fornost region. Um, so he does have some kind of knowledge that up here in the North Downs, there are monsters and scary things, right? So the Dunedain are up here keeping the monsters and scary things from coming down. The Dunedain don't immediately pounce upon any rumors of brigands down in the Breelands, right? Because that's... Compared to what's up here in the North Down, the brigand problem is pretty minor, even though, yeah. you know, it seems kind of like a big deal. Well, um, not minor, but certainly doable. To doable, like, you know, yeah, exactly. On his, his lot. Yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, as Tarloniel says, like real life cops, the Dunedain job is probably 95% boredom, 5% adrenaline. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> you do you do get that impression. Um, Possibly paperwork. Yeah, exactly filing more reports right yeah yeah another another uh blood chilling creature destroyed today and i've gotta file my report um uh uh nothing could be more likely um but uh anyway so i i i, I really love the concept of trestle bridge and i i thought about this a lot when i you know came wandering around trestle bridge and and first uh, journeyed up here especially given you know it seems to me very prominent in the way they've done it in the game because non uh nanwathrin which is right across the uh, the river here from trestle bridge is this on the one hand it's it's isolated but it's like a very dangerous region it's a massive orc camp there um in which i used to get lost very regularly <laughs> and uh uh, but it's isolated, right? It's isolated by 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 rivers and gorges, so that these the large number of orcs in this camp cannot just spill down south into the Breeland um, without taking the uh, the the trestle bridge. So and we saw the same thing with Farnos last time too. Yes, we had that one uh, the very narrow valley entrance into Evan. And that's where the Dunedain is. Is that's where M- Mincham is sitting, right? So that and that's where he is parked his uh his fireplace um yeah yeah um okay so as we continue so thinking about the so here we've come at the greenway we, we we can see on the map here that the the greenway will continue up to uh to fornos we can ride up to where we got to last time and uh rejoin or rather meet up with uh where we got to before I love one of my favorite things in the game is looking at the horizon, especially when it's what is it dawn? No, uh, sunset. Four dawn. It's four dawn. Yeah. Anyway, as the as the horizons are growing red, because uh, you can see that you know this the the really cool mixture of trees but also ruins up there, right? You can uh, it looks like you know when you're up here in Arnor, you can always see a ruin. Somewhere off in the distance. I think we call that red light cat's light. My house. Oh, cool. Uh, see, look, there's a lo- there's a nearer ruin. Oh, and the first of our blasted trees. Oh, and there they are. Right. So here we've the trees are sporadic here, but healthy. Right. And now we're beginning to come into the area where things become distinctly unwholesome. <laughs> and this is. I, I've yeah. Seen a blighted forest. Too. We were driving, uh, I think, up to Indiana and somewhere around uh, Pennsylvania. We just saw all these white, diseased trees all over the place. And immediately, me and Rachel were thinking, this looks like Fornost. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Right. And there's Emon Reith. The... So there's Minchum over there on that side and Emon Reith up over there where we were last time. Um, uh, and Fornost, of course, across which we came from the Evendim side before. That's, of course, the land, the legends of which have made it down to Bree and prompt Butterbur to call it haunted land, haunted country. Um, but uh, but yes, Boomful, the uh, the the trees are only mostly dead, as we <laughs> saw before. Uh, Lighted. Yeah, which is cool. They are. We definitely get a once in future king kind of uh, feel from oh, the trees yeah. of Fornost there. 
you know, they're they are starting to come back. Uh, anyway, all right. So we're going to end here. We'll uh, next time we will continue through because we're I, we're soon we're going to get to the Barrow Downs. We'll do some Barrow Down exploration. Um, we'll probably spend a couple weeks exploring the Barrow Downs, but um, uh, we're still not quite there yet, of course. So we'll we'll be. Uh, um, uh, we'll still be up here in the North Downs for a while. I'm going to go through the North Downs and then up into Angmar. Uh, but, um, but again, we'll also interrupt to go down into, uh, uh, into the Barrow Downs and then from there into Breland as well. So we'll be in this area, uh, for a while. I want to head out, uh, up into, uh, uh, Anundir, uh, or Anundir, of course, as it should be pronounced there, and then into Kingsfell and up into Nan Amlung and stuff if we have time uh, for next time. So. Oh, and, and uh, everyone, you've been warned, if we're going to try to make it into Angmar, anyone who wants to come on the field trips needs to get that uh, epic line quest for Angmar. Yes. Past, past the Guardian statue. Yes, we were reflecting on that, that of course you don't have... Uh, uh, no matter how carefully you dodge mobs, you don't have unlimited access to Mordor or not Mordor, Angmar. Um, so, and I think we're going to have to do that on Landreval because um, I'm going to need support of my locals uh, in order to do that. So I think we're going to plan to do most of Angmar from Landreval when we get to that point. Um, we'll see what we can manage and you can get summoned past it and we'll see what we can sort out but it's going to get a little more complicated up there so gonna get a bit hairy yeah so sure it's a volume six isn't it of book one of the epic uh it escapes me currently but i think it sounds about right it's I, the, it's, I think it's, it's book six the, yeah i think it's book six yeah. and it's uh given to you by one of the rangers in the tent and first yeah yeah so exactly brandon one does not simply walk into angmar that is exactly uh, <laughs> what you find happens. Um, One has to do mini quests. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Um, uh, very good. So I will see you guys again next week. I'm going to be, a, I'm, I'm going to be traveling again in November. I'll be gone for a week, but uh, I still should be around for the next couple of weeks, I think. So awesome. we'll see you guys next week. We'll continue our, 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 dis well, we will leave the house of Tom Bombadil in our book discussion, and then we will continue our examination of the North Downs here. So thanks everybody uh, awesome. for being with me tonight. Uh, thank you, Valori, for uh, your accompaniment here on the, on the uh, field trip. And I will see you guys next week. All right. Good night, everyone. Bye everybody. Thanks for joining me on this epic exploration of The Lord of the Rings and of Standing Stone's video adaptation of Tolkien's story. If you are having even half the fun I'm having on this journey, I hope you will consider supporting the project by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.